there's a lady in, our, in one of the other services named Mary Ellen. You all know Mary Ellen around here. She's taught in here. She's very prophetic and a gifted teacher. And she gave me a prophetic word that was spoken by the late uh, prophet uh, Bob Jones. He just recently passed away. And oh man, I, people are going to miss that brother. Um, you know what, there was something about Bob Jones when he spoke. I, I listened to him. I tried to hear what he was saying. I could, you can tell when the Spirit of the Lord is moving through a testimony, can't you? Yeah, and he, and, and he was saying some things uh, last fall, and she gave it to me. I don't know why she gave it to me, but she did. And, and I started reading just a little bit of it, and things started bearing witness with my spirit. The same kinds of things that I've been praying for, that the Spirit's been leading me into, trying to, to establish in, in this fellowship is what he was talking about. And I believe it's the heart of the Lord. And so here's a partial quote uh, from Bob Jones, uh, late, uh, well, last year, around the fall in 2013. He said that the way that uh, the church was uh, doing church, I'm paraphrasing a little bit, is coming to an end. He said he would believe he believed it would happen in 2013 or or 14, and then he goes on talking about the heavens. The heavens declare the handiwork of God. He said I've always paid attention to what the heavens are saying. How many think we should be paying attention oh, yes. to what the heavens are saying? He says there is a comet coming, Ison, on Thanksgiving, Hanukkah. How many remember that the comet? It was a pretty significant deal. Um, on, it's going to come on Thanksgiving Day. It's a sign that God has given you new guidelines in the church. Righteousness and holiness. How many think that's a good guideline? Really Righteousness good. and holiness. Is it on Thanksgiving Day? Well, it was this last year. Last year. He says we, we spent all this time uh, studying to please the church now, but it, it has no purpose. But God isn't looking after degrees. That's, that's, uh, that's what we've studied for is degrees. This is what he said. The Lord has said now, put away your degrees. Come forth with your decrees. Amen. Decrease. Praise and, the Lord. Oh man, we've been all after trying yep. to get people into the promises of God. Oh, and making the declaration. It's a way. That's a, what makes a way. It helps to make a way for the working power of the Spirit yes. to work in your life. There's power in professing, confessing, decreeing. God's word. And uh, he says, uh, put away your degrees and come forth with your degrees. Not that there's wrong anything wrong with degrees, but he wants us to make, uh, to speak his word. He right. says, your prayers will change when you begin decreeing. That's right. Uh, you will decree a matter and it will come to pass. Right. And that's in the word. Job 22, 28. If you want to know where that is, it says, you shall also decree a thing and it shall be established unto thee, and the light shall shine upon thy ways. Right and, and there's promises in, in the Bible. Oh. It's all over. And so then he goes on talking about the manifestations of the sons of God. He says, we are in one of the great, greatest stages right now for the sons and daughters of God are coming forth. Yes, this is in line with scripture, right? And then he starts quoting Psalms 82, which says, The Lord has said, you are God's, you are the sons and daughters of God. How many believe, how many sons and daughters of God are in this place? Amen. And so that is a big deal, to be a son and a daughter. And to live below that mark. Oh man, I don't know about you, but I can't live with myself if I do that. I'm trying to go for it. And so we all are. And uh, praise the Lord. And so all I can tell you is, is some of what I, everything I just read to you, the Lord has been leading me into and more, and we're trying to go for this. And anybody got a little confirmation on some of that in here? Oh yeah. Yeah. Okay. This is what I mean. There's the, there's the one Holy Spirit. He's speaking to the body around the world. I believe he is. And uh, he, how many believe that the, the earth needs to see Jesus in you in a greater way? I see him already. I'm looking in the mirror, and I, man, I, I still see some of me. Lord, help me, you know. Yeah, we need to, we need to see more of Jesus. Hallelujah. That's what really can touch people—the love of God. 
uh, the truth, right? Shall make us free. Hallelujah. And so what he's placing on my heart to share today um, is part of, if you will, what I believe the Lord wants to do. Something new in our church, I believe, in the corporate church that he wants, he wants the church to start doing more of. I know there's some churches doing this. We're trying to, but he says to me, he says, there needs to be a shift in focus. Um, please hear me. I think this is prophetic, too. That what many are focusing on in the church, in the relationships within the church, is what's hindering the church. I'm not saying that there isn't a lot of good stuff being focused on in the church, but um, it's what we're not focusing on that's, that's connected to the heart of the Father that's hindering the church and, and, and the increase of the church. And I'll explain what I mean. Um, and I believe that this Psalm 82 is an our word. That right here, I mean, part of becoming a son of God is having the heart of the Father. To have the nature, uh, the love of God, to, to be concerned. And I'm telling you, Psalm 82 is speaking to me big time right now. I believe it's a now word. So if you have your Bibles, flip over to Psalms 82, and I'll just read it out. Beginning in verse 1. I like that. Yeah, I've got the papers flipped in there. I can hear all these Bibles. And maybe some Bible apps are flowing too in the phones. Yeah. Yeah. It says, God stands in the congregation of the mighty. He judges among the gods. How long will you judge unjustly and accept the persons of the wicked? Selah. That's verse 2. Verse 3, defend, hear these words, defend the poor and fatherless, do justice to the afflicted and needy. This is what he's calling the sons of God to do, right? Deliver, hear that word, deliver. We're talking about deliverance big time around here, right? How many believe that, we, that God has called us to be sons of God? He's saying, deliver the poor and the needy, rid them out of the hand of the wicked. Yes. Oh man, he says, they know not, neither will they understand. They walk on in darkness. All the foundations of the earth are out of course. How many believe that just things just aren't right out in the world? There's, things are crazy out there. Oh man. He says, I have said you are gods and all of you are, the, are children of the Most High. You guys are children of the Most High. How awesome is that? Very awesome. Oh man, but you shall die like men. It goes on to say, verse 7, and fall like one of the princes. Arise, O God, judge the earth, for thou shalt inherit all nations. A lot of sobering words in there. And um, I tell you, when reading this, things just started jumping out to me. One thing is, I'll just, I'll just make a little mention here, that I believe God is judging and will be judging in this generation um, uh, those who are judging people unjustly within the church, outside of the church. Oh man, this is the people that are lost in the world, that people are looking at the wrong way. You know, he'll be judging the unjust judgments even. Uh, I believe that he will and now is <coughs> judging those who are accepting those things which are clearly defined as evil in the scripture that they're accepting them, that many churches uh, are accepting. I believe, oh man, that this is a word for the church, that God is going to deal with it, that he is dealing with it. How many believe it? There's a lot of stuff that are being compromised. And, oh man, we can't compromise the word of God. Oh man, that's not, as, as representatives of the kingdom of God, you know, that's like treason to compromise the word, right? Serious matter with God. I really believe that. But what I'm led to focus on, I just wanted to open up that can of worms there a little bit. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to open a few things up today and let you guys deal with them, all right? Is that okay? Amen. Yeah. That's one. Okay. But what he's put on my heart to talk about, and I believe this is the heart of, of, of the Father here that will really bring God on the scene, is seen in verses 3 through 6. And uh, let's look at it again. Defend the poor and fatherless. 
We're, we can do this as sons of God. As men, it's different, you know. We can try, but not the way they really needed to be defended. We can do justice to the afflicted and needy. Oh, man. I tell you, we went to paradise. I'll just, I mean, we're seeing people getting touched. And um, it doesn't matter what you have or don't have in the natural realm. Just know that if you receive Jesus, you know, you're going to have all the resources you need. He's going to make a way. And what they really need is His presence, His power touching them. Resources will, f will follow after you and touch people. Uh, there's a, a little boy. We went to paradise yesterday and we met this young man in a restaurant and his grandmother, just in a restaurant. They were in an AA meeting or an NA meeting up there. And... Um, didn't know him, and I, I invited her in, and come to find out this guy was just, nobody in the world wanted him, you know, except her. And she wasn't even his, her, her, her born, her blood uh, grandson. And she was helping him out, she needed help herself. And so one thing led to another, they came into the meeting, and we started praying and, and ministering, and I found out he wasn't saved, and that he was having some really bad thoughts, you know. Uh, the enemy was trying to destroy him and just a little boy and so he got saved and, God. and he started getting freedom and you should see him now he's just glowing he's we got a little men's group going and he guys up there are taking him to the meetings you know and they're trying to help him and work with him yeah. he doesn't really have a father figure but these guys are stepping up to the plate and you know what his needs are being met God's it's amazing to see that transformation. And I don't bring that out to draw attention to our ministry, but you just can't uh, put in words what happens on the inside of you when you step into this, when God's love starts changing you. Oh man, I saw another guy come in, young guy, uh, caught up in, uh, in uh, occultic activities, I'll say it that way, who had, you know, a lot of stuff, you know, weighing him down, destroying his life, destroying his mind where he can't even think. And he was there yesterday. He came to one of our meetings down here and they moved up in the hills and guess what? The Lord is touching him, setting him free. And uh, I can tell you so many stories of, of, of people that, uh, and it's right, I believe that's the heart of the Lord. And so it says, deliver the poor and needy. We need to do that. We need to pull them out of the hands of the devil. And we can do it as sons of God. They don't know. Neither will they understand. They walk on in darkness. All the foundations of the earth are out of course. So we need to, we need to help them. And this is what God is wanting us to focus on. The needy ones out there. Uh, and so, in other words, if we're focusing on our own interests, and I'm saying that we don't need to deal with our stuff too in the church, uh, but only within the church, if that's our focus, we might find ourselves disconnected from the heart of the Father. And uh, we might miss out on the major part of, of why we are here, why we are sons of God. And uh, another minister I, I listen to every once in a while, I'm very fond of, he said something. He said he heard this from another minister. It impacted him. He said it, it impacted me. So I thought, I'm going to impact you guys with it. <laughs> And so here it is. He said, the disciples belonged before they believed. And let that hit your spirit. And in other words, I believe that the Lord is, is revealing to us, um, has been, that there's a lot of people. I mean, there's a lot of people that are predestined to be saved, that in the heart of God belong to Him, but because people... People in the church, many of them have lost sight of, of where our efforts are to be focused that many in the world, even though they belong, they do not yet believe. How many believe that could be happening? Yeah, that's that was happening in my life, I'm telling you. And so, we were, we're, you know, the church is studying and focusing on a lot of good things. Here we are in the last days, that's one good thing to be focusing on. But we really can't afford uh, to, to not focus on the victory and to apply what Jesus did on the cross to, to bring us into that fellowship where we can know God, 
You know, not, it's not about just coming to church and going to heaven. It's about becoming a son, a daughter of God, and knowing the Father, right? Yep. And, uh, oh man. And so there really is something about that. We, you know, we need to, we need to shift our focus because so many have failed to, to apply that victory to their life. And don't be mad at me if I'm touching on anybody's life here, but because of this, it, it is, it's, it's created a climate in the church. The church has, in a large part, I'm not saying everywhere, but the, a lot of people have been acclimated uh, to a mindset of defeat, of inability to help and to do things about the problems in the world. Uh, it's almost like we've taken on the spirit of the world and its expectation of, of what could actually happen in our life. But I'm telling you, we just read, you are all sons yes. of the Most High, daughters of the Most High God. You've got something that you can, you can deal with. How many believe that? Yes. And so that's what he wants to stir. He wants us to, to, to grow in this, in this revelation. And so before this started to come into focus this week, you know, the Lord gave me a verse. He gives me verses to chew on. And I didn't really understand what he was talking to me about in the beginning, but he gave me John chapter 1, verse 12. If you have your Bibles, flip over to John 1, 12. And I mean, it's just amazing how, how Jesus, the Word of God, came into the world. It says in John chapter 1, he came into the world. It says the world was made by him. He came unto his own, and they didn't even recognize him. I mean, there was... I mean, some of these religious leaders were probably geniuses on that. I mean, to be able to, re to have the whole Torah memorized, to know it inside and out, is a big deal, right? Amen. But yet, they didn't recognize the very one they were, they were learning about. He was right there in their presence, and they missed him. And there's a great revelation in that. You know, but yet, a prostitute recognized him real quick. She was at his feet, you know, wiping, you know, oh man, with her hair. And the tax collectors, they recognized him pretty quickly, right? The fishermen and the people that had needs, that had devils and problems. And I mean, that's where Jesus went to where there was a need. Yes. And that's where people will recognize the Christ in you, uh, you know, if you go out to where the need is. How many... Yeah, and so these guys, the religious leaders, they, they thought they had it. They thought they didn't. They had it all. They knew it. And they missed. They missed the one that was right there in front of them. And I'm telling you, there's a lot of people that are missing out on a lot. Yeah. There is. And, but God wants to shift our focus. How many ready to shift? Yeah. Some of you are in this already. Praise the Lord. But I'm telling you, there's room for improvement. And so he's had me decree this verse all week long. I've been decreeing it, and this message I'm sharing is a result of my decree, you know. He says, but as many as received him, to them gave he power. Excusia, you have the ability. All you got to do is receive Jesus to become sons of God, to do those same kinds of things that Jesus did, to help people, to pull them out of hell, to out of the snatches of the, of the devil and, uh, and set them on the rock on the right way, on the right path. And, I mean, God needs us. I mean, that's part of our role. Isn't that pretty cool? Oh, and, yeah. and so, as we begin to see in Scripture who we are called to, to be and those things He's calling us to do, and, and when we look at all the needs around us in the world and start to make justifications for not going out, for not doing this, um, I'm telling you, we're, I think we're doing a great injustice to, to what Jesus did, to the name of Jesus. Says so this comes to even those who believe on his name. And uh, not only to, 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 to the name of Jesus, but to those that have yet to believe, we're doing them an injustice. But God is going to shift. He's going to bring a shift. There's going to be a move. How many is ready to yes. move? Yeah. Amen. Oh, man. Praise the Lord. I like what it says at verse 13. It says, it goes on to say, concerning the sons of God, which were born, 
not of blood, nor of the will of the flesh. If you've been born again, it's not by your will. How many have been born again and think that it was your, your choice? You know? <laughs> yeah, we have to accept them, but it's not by the, the will of the flesh or the will of man, but of God. And that's what I'm, I'm trying to bind my will to His will so that really, if you don't have the will of God, you're not going to have the heart of God. You're not going to be able to do much. But uh, but we can, right? Amen. Hallelujah. We can receive Him, and we can have the ability to become sons, daughters of, the, of God. Hallelujah. hallelujah. And do something. Yes. Jesus, hallelujah. And so He took me to something else to, to bring out today. Um, in First Chronicles, uh, we see a, a picture, a prophetic picture, I believe, of what we are entering into in this generation. First Chronicles chapter 12 uh, and verse 23, it starts to paint the picture. And uh, I believe that uh, it's a similar thing that we're in, entering into here. Go read it, the whole thing in context later on, but verse 23 starts to bring out the picture. It says, and these are the numbers of the bands that were ready armed to war and came to David, to Hebron, to turn the kingdom of Saul to him according to the word of the Lord. Oh man, how many believe that God wants to raise up some people uh, to make things right, you know, that belong to Christ? And, oh yeah, how many feel like the devil's stolen from you too? And, well anyways, my point is, is there's a revelation here out of all the tribes, the 12 tribes of Israel, one tribe, the tribe of Issachar, if you read on down in verse 32, was ordained and they were destined to understand the times and the seasons that they were in. How many believe as sons of God, God is calling you to understand the times and the seasons that you are in? And not only that, but verse 32 reveals that they also knew what they were to do. And this is what God is revealing, I believe. I believe around the world, in the church, God is raising people up and, uh, to know what time what we're in and what we are to do. And I'm telling you, it's, it's very empowering, uh, liberating. It says, and of the children of Issachar, this is verse 32, which were men that had understanding of the times to know what Israel ought to do, the heads of them were 200, and all their brethren were at their commandment. And so, I believe God is raising people up around the world with this message that it's time to, to, to rid the enemy out of our lives, out of our churches, out of our land, to take back, to enter into the enemy's camp, like that old song goes, you know, that part of it, and take back what the devil stole. Huh. And then give it back to the people that need it, you know. Help people out. How many believe that it's time? Yeah. Amen. And I think that's part of the season that we're in. And to do it, all you got to do is receive him. And his, he's going to give you the power to do these things. And praise the Lord. So, another theme that he had me uh, look at and revisit, actually, is... Uh, is the parable of the sower. Uh, I'm not going to look. I'm not going to read it out, but go and read it on your own. But um, this is in Mark 13, verses 9 through 11. Is what I want to focus on. Is is um, here's a revelation that revelation isn't just given carelessly. This revelation, this 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 revelation, this knowledge is is precious. Yes. It's like gold, right? And it's not given carelessly. And Jesus gave the parable of the sower, and the disciples didn't understand it all, and the, and the people didn't. And he says, hey, why are you speaking to the people in parables? And he said, because it's given unto you to know the mysteries of the kingdom of heaven, but to them it's not given. And, and there's a reason why he said that. I believe I, I have an understanding of that in part. He says, for whosoever has to him shall be given, and he shall have more abundance, but whosoever has not, from him shall be taken away even that which he has. Right. And, oh man, and so my point is, 
is that the revelation that we're talking about today is not something that you can just dig out of a book somewhere. I mean, you can't even read the Bible and have this understanding apart from the Holy Spirit. We need the Holy Spirit empowering us, uh, revealing these things to us. Um, but revelation is something that must be revealed by the Holy Spirit. And, and I believe the Lord conceals things with purpose. In other words, He wants those uh, that have that right heart to find the truth and to come into the wisdom and be empowered. Yeah. He wants Amen. those that have the heart that He can trust that will take it at the truth and not misuse the truth and twist it and allow the enemy to come in and allow people to get hurt. Right. I mean, we're, we've been given the ministry of reconciliation. Right. But so many people, I can't tell you how, how many people have been hurt. <coughs> In places by people uh, you know because they've misused they misrepresented the truth and that's what the Lord doesn't want to happen and so those people that have, to have the right heart like David you know they're gonna they're gonna find it if they look he puts it just here it's here but you got to look with the right heart and he'll make sure you find it isn't that something the Spirit will make sure how many want to find find some things it says in Proverbs 25, 2, that the Lord, it's the glory of God to conceal a thing, but it's the honor of kings. And you're all called kings and priests in Revelation chapter 1. It's the honor of kings to search out a matter. How many like to, to go gold, gold panning? If you ever do it in the world, be careful. You can catch gold fever. Mess you up. I'll just tell you. I know what I'm talking about. But are there any kings in this place? Amen. Hallelujah. Yes. Oh, man. I like what it says. Let me read verse 3 here. Let's go beyond this verse 2. So many quote just that verse. It says in verse 3, The heaven for height, the earth for depth, and the heart of kings is unsearchable. Take away the dross from the silver, and there shall come forth a vessel for the finer. Where is that? Proverbs 25, verse, oh. verse uh, uh, 3 and 4. Take away the... How many would like to just make a way for your vessel to, 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 to be cleansed of any dross, so that the refined fire of the Holy Spirit can come and cause that righteousness, that holiness of Jesus to reflect out wherever you go. Amen. Would you like to see some of that? Oh yeah. Oh yeah. That's a that's a real fire. I'm telling you, refining fire. Take the wicked from before the king, and his throne shall be established in righteousness. How many would like to see some of the the kingdom, dominion, and authority established in the in the realm of, of the life in this city in a greater way? Oh yeah. I'm telling you. And uh, I think that that's some of what needs to happen before the church corporately can rise up and understand and be empowered to do what we're all called to do and to be as sons of God. So God's getting us ready for this great move. Who, who wants to make a way for God to get you ready? Hallelujah. Yeah, that's what I do, I tell you. And so, I mean, what's it going to take to... to to get us to go beyond these four walls and reach in the world like Jesus did, I'm telling you, you're going to have to have a heart like, like David. You're going to have to be, uh, you know, wanting to please the Father. You're going to have to adjust your focus to where the needs really are. And so to do this, the Lord revealed to me that, you know, that what we really need is, is to be faithful. I'm telling you, um, being faithful to God, to His Word, uh, will empower you to help those people that, that need to come into the kingdom. Uh, any faithful people in this place? We're, we're all called to be faithful. Amen. A lot of the problems that we encounter in church is because of unfaithfulness. Yeah. Right. The reason why so many people can't get a lot of things done in church or in their lives is because they're, 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 going, they're going too many places. I'm just going to throw that out there. You, get, you know, God's called you to a place to work and to, and to be used. You have a purpose and a destiny. And He's calling us to assemble. I mean, to not forsake the assembly of ourselves together. 
In other words, we come together not just to, to, to go to heaven someday, but to function in the truth. Right. And, to, and we have a place, a position in the kingdom with purpose. And if you want to start seeing some of your purpose, uh, how many would like to have more purpose in your life? Yet you, you, you need to let the Lord, uh, you know, show you his heart, where he wants you to go and what he wants you to do. And you're going to see the Spirit of the Lord just come all over you. One lady this last week, I was praying for a lady, and the Lord gave me a word of knowledge. And, and he says that she was like, you know, totally draw, you know, done with, with things. Her, her job, she was totally had it. She didn't want to do what she'd been doing for 20 years. She had no life going on outside of the, uh, of the church. And she was dried up in, in a lot of ways. And, and our Lord spoke that to me. And he told me to pray for her. And she confirmed it that she was done. She was done with her job and all this stuff. And she wanted to do something different. How many want to do something with meaning? Yes. And so, you know what? He can turn everything around and make everything new. Even if you've been working at the same old, same old for 20 years. He can, he can, he can make everything new. And I prayed. The Lord said, pray for her to have some divine appointments. And so I did. And, and this lady was very reserved. Really a, a, just a really precious person in the Lord. She, she wouldn't come up for church for nothing. I mean, and I said, does anybody need some prayer? She goes, I need some prayer. But it wasn't for her. It was for this family that their, their marriage has fallen apart because of unfaithfulness, you know. Or, or what, I don't know what it is exactly, but in other words, her heart was going out, and, and you should see she had light in her eyes. I mean, something comes to life in you when you see somebody hurting, and, you, and God's called you to pray and to do things, just like what she was saying in her testimony. <coughs> Isn't that amazing, uh, what God is doing in that situation? She just started praying for her, her classmates, and here they are, they're calling her up, finding her 20 years later. That's pretty cool, I think. 30 years later. 30, oh, 30. I was trying to be kind. <laughs> okay. 30 years later, okay. Wow, 30 years? Wow, oh, you're getting old. I know. You still look good, though. Thank you. Okay. Oh, yeah. Let's see. Yeah. i got to work on those brown points, yeah. <laughs> you're lucky. Oh, Praise the Lord. And so... Uh, Oh, man. And so this is a big deal. Well, the Lord is telling me that um, if we're not faithful to God and to His Word, uh, we're, we're not going to be able to help anybody. And not only that, you're not going to be, you know, if you're not faithful, you're not going to be able to, to minister, to do those things, to, to see the need in the right light and do much about it. But faithfulness connects you to the power of God and um, our men's, we have a men's Bible study. Every week we meet in different places and I'm trying to get one of those fired up over here. Um, but anyways, this men's Bible study, something came out this last week and, and it just jumped at me again. Uh, it says, when a faithful man is unfaithful, he is faithful to repent. What do you think about that? And there's power in there. I mean, the enemy moves, realize it's through unfaithfulness that the enemy moves in, That's right. destroys, separates, breaks things up. Um, in Scripture, we see the principle of committing God's truth to others. We're supposed to take this gospel message and share it right. and, 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 and reach to the next generation too, right? Yes. But what happens if we become faithful in our assignment, we become unable. And the result of this is just all kinds of problems coming in, getting in your, I mean, it, 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 it hit the church and it hit your personal life too. I'm telling you, the, the spirit will start. It, all, it, all he needs is a crack to get in your foundation and he'll just blow you up. Anybody know what that's like? <laughs> wow. So, let me just move on here a little bit. Okay. I mean, these truths, these are precious truths, eternal truths. They're committed to us, to, to, 
to share and to do it in the right manner, right? Through faith, with, right. with a genuine heart of concern and love. And, uh, and so, like David, and there's people, Paul was a good example of, of, of conveying the truth. Hear what he said to the Corinthian church, 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 4. He said in 1 Corinthians 2, verse 4, he says, My speech and my preaching was not with enticing words of man's wisdom, but in demonstration of the spirit and the power. Yes. Wow. <coughs> Isn't that amazing? That's our mandate, is to bring a demonstration of the spirit and power. Um, that your faith should not stand in the wisdom of men, but in the power of God. And when we become unfaithful in that assignment, uh, following after his footsteps, he was walking in what Jesus did, people start pulling these truths that are above the natural mindset <coughs> down to their level of understanding, and it starts, um, it starts getting ugly quick. I'll just say it that way. Anybody know what I'm talking about? It can, you know, we get religious doctrines and things that don't, yeah, they might have a form of truth, but they don't function in the truth. How many want to live in the truth? Yeah. He says, uh, we speak wisdom among them that are perfect, yet not the wisdom of the world, nor of the princes of this world that come to, to naught or nothing, but we speak the wisdom of God in the mystery of even the hidden mystery which God ordained before the world unto our glory, which none of the princes of this world knew, for had they known it, they would not have crucified the Lord of glory. And so he's called you all into a higher realm uh, to walk in faithfulness and integrity. And I'm telling you, if you start becoming faithful to do this, you're going to see God uh, showing up in your life and circumstances empowering you to keep that covenant. How many believe that? That's what we need to see. And so, my point is, is, is faithfulness reveals the character. It really does. Faithlessness reveals the character too. Uh, for example, when a woman, I can, I'm going to open up some stuff here, okay? I can, it could be either way though. When a woman marries a man with potential, but lacks in faithfulness to his commitment, the covenant commitment, her life will soon become a living hell. And if there are kids involved, it would just spread through everything. I'm telling you the truth. Uh, in business, I come out of the business world. I wasn't raised in church. and Even in ministry, I've seen people come in with lots of potential. Brother, you were a builder. You've probably seen it. Lots of potential, but because of, of faithlessness, they didn't go very far. Not only that, but I saw the enemy just make huge inroads in their life. Not every once in a while, but every time. I'm telling you, there's something about being faithful that keeps you in the right place. It's something we got to fight to do. How many are, are okay with that? Yep. Oh, man. And so God is not impressed with our abilities, our degrees. Praise the Lord for people that have gone to college and all that. But... You know, our purpose is, is to use it for His glory, you know, from his, by His wisdom, His leading. Um, you know, he, He's after a heart of true faithfulness, true genuine concern for others. Uh, that's what He's after. Uh, a heart that's after His heart. How many want to be like that? Yes. And that's what He's trying to, to awaken us to. And I think the reason why there's so many problems in so many places is simply because of faithlessness. Yeah. And remember, the, the enemy is working. You really do have an adversary. And this came out in our little Bible study this week, that he works indirectly. He likes to work behind the scenes indirectly. He, he, I'll tell you, a major way that the enemy works is through your works. The works of the flesh. I'm not saying yours personally, but if you got them and then the world of the flesh, it'll work through them. It'll work of the flesh, but the enemy will come in through the works of the flesh. Most people know we've been warned against the works of the flesh, uh, but I'm telling you, this, the enemy will work through that big time. Nathan the prophet told King David, 
who, you know, had a problem. You know, he, you know, he had adultery with Bathsheba. He said that this this caused blasphemy against the worthy name of Jehovah. As a king, he was representing Jehovah. How holy and righteous is that? I mean, and so we got to be careful what we do. You know, uh, we'll we'll um, you know work. I mean, we'll, who who are we representing? Jesus, right? And Jehovah, the kingdom of God. And we don't want to cause blasphemy against the name of God, do we? So your actions really have an impact on God and how people see you, people in the world who are lost. Chapter 2 in, in, in Romans reveals that when a minister preaches against adultery and then gets caught up into it, or if he lectures about not coveting money, then he's found coveting money if he preaches against stealing and he's found in thievery, oh man, it, it reveals that it causes blasphemy among <coughs> unbelievers. In other words, your life, your, your faithlessness can actually hinder people from coming into the kingdom. Wow, that's pretty heavy, huh? Yeah. It really is. And we're, we're warned, Galatians 5, not to commit the works of the flesh. And most people... Try to, to abstain from adultery, from, you know, there's all kinds of them in there, from murder and witchcraft, idolatry, and you know what? But there's one listed in there that so many don't really understand that they're falling into more than they may realize. And it's called sedition. And um, anybody know what sedition is? And that's one of the works of the flesh. It's a, it's a spirit of dissension, separation. And uh, it is just ripping through places. We've had it come through our church. Uh, we're start, we had to do a start over in one place because the spirit of division came in. And I'll explain what that is. And, uh, it's really, it's a spirit of division. It's really treason, if you think about it, against the kingdom of God. I mean, a lot of people would reject, good people, even church people, would reject the thought of treason, but yet because they know very little of, about the, what the sedition <coughs> is, so many are falling into it in a measure. And uh, it happens. Um, <clears throat> the seditious act could be, I'll, I'll just pick on myself. My little daughter's not in here right now. But when she was little, she still tries it every once in a while, but she'd go ask her mom for something or try to do something and she tell her no, and then she'd come and get on my lap and say, Daddy, can I have this, or can I do that? And her little eyes, and she calls you Daddy, you know. And <laughs> next thing you know, you, 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 you're opening up a big can of worms, and, and uh, it, can, it can bring problems in, into your marriage. I mean, we gotta, it can bring it into the church, right? Sometimes I even knew that she had told her no, and I said, okay. You know, because I, I buckled. I mean, she says, you know, this is a while back. She says, whatever you do, don't buy her ice cream. Now it's coffee, you know. Don't buy her Starbucks, you know. And I take her to school or whatever, and she says, Daddy, can we get a, an ice cream? And I buckled. Oh, I thought, though, well, we didn't go to Starbucks. <laughs> they went to another coffee place instead, because I said, don't buy her Starbucks. So they find a legal loophole. <laughs> <laughs> but, then I, but then I say, don't tell on me, don't tell on me. And what she does, what does she do? She rats me out every time. Well, they leave the evidence in the car. I mean, as funny as that might, think, might seem, you know, when they're little, they grow up and it's not so funny. That's right. And we got to be very careful. And, uh, and I mean, I'm telling you, God, we can do that with the Word of God. And, and we got to be careful. We need to be together right. with one another on this to keep the enemy out of, of our groups. One guy this week, um, wow, one guy this week brought something up concerning um, churches. And I kind of cringe when people talk about churches. I try to, I'm for all the churches. I just want to say that, I mean, if, you don't, if you're not for all the churches, we got to watch out. We got to be for. We don't have to compromise the word of God, but we need to be for the church, you know, and for 
thank God for all the grace that's in all the churches, and we've we got to be right. for the people, right? Right. But uh, this brother brought out in a meeting this week a very valid point concerning cliques that can form in churches. Right. Anybody know? I mean, church is supposed to be a place where you can come to get help, to get healed. And, and, and so often, when we're faithless to our, our commitment, and, uh, people get hurt. Anybody ever been hurt? Yep. Yep. And, and people will come into groups and, and they will, they will, they'll have their own little circle. It happens, I'm telling you, people won't admit it, but it happens a lot. A I've lot. seen it, I've been in it, I've seen it happen. I've been impacted by it. Yeah. The devil will come right through. It will bring a division, it will undermine authority, it undermines the word of God. It, it doesn't help the people that come in that, that, that needs to be helped. I mean, they might, they might be homeless. And I mean, you know what? We gotta we gotta treat everybody the same. That's right. Uh, or or they might be a little different, and we don't know them, you know. Or or they'll judge you by your appearance. Anybody know what that's like? And I mean, look what God used to 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 bring King David. And what was his merit? He had a heart, right? And look what God did through the most unlikely one of of the sons of Jesse. He he raised up a a king and anointed him, right? Oh man, he slew the devil, uh, the, uh, the Goliath with his own sword. A kid, a young guy. I mean, it's amazing, right? Because he had the right heart. And so, I kind of lose, lost my point here. <laughs> we got to be careful uh, about judging one another. We're forming little groups, and it's okay to have groups, I think, within the church. We've got, we've got circles of friends, but like in Valley Springs, I mean, it's, there's really something really unique happening. And really, it's really cool. These people so love, I mean, they got their circle of friends, but therefore, somebody new comes in, they bring them in, you know, and therefore everybody, and it's, it's, it's the heart that we're after too, all of us. And you know what, they, they love everybody. And I think that's the way it should be, right? Nobody's left out. Um, but so often people get hurt and it's a spirit of sedition will come in and it will rip right through the church, blow it apart. It's come through one of our groups. We had to start over in one group. Yeah, Jezebel. Anybody here Jezebel comes through and it gets ugly. It was bad. We, we, we stood up. And you know what? You go through these things and it just strengthens you, you know, and... And we're not going to have a victim mentality. It, it just helps you uh, to resist the enemy. And so if we're not careful, that thing will come in when the Lord starts moving and we'll try to bust things up. He's getting us ready to keep. And we all got to be in this together. You know, what, you know what I mean? And so, praise the Lord. Um, this week a guy called me. Can you guys take a little bit more? A guy called me uh, about Galatians chapter 2 uh, concerning um, Peter and Paul. And it's just another signpost along the way. Um, and I feel led to kind of just touch on it here. If you have your Bibles, turn to um, Galatians chapter 2. And here you see some of what we're talking about in a different angle. A different angle. Um, Paul's talking, verse 1, he says, Then 14 years after I went up again to Jerusalem, Galatians chapter 2, verse 1, with Barnabas and took Titus with me also, I went up by revelation. Hear that? He went by revelation. How many believe we should run with revelation and be propelled by grace, right? And communicated unto them that gospel which I preach among the Gentiles, but privately to them which were of reputation, lest by any means I should run or have run in vain. But neither Titus, who was with me, being a Greek, was compelled to be circumcised. Uh, you know, as a grown man, I could, I could identify with that. Yeah. But I'm serious, so, you know, he wasn't compelled. But listen to the reason why. Because that of false brethren unawares brought in, who came in privily to spy out our liberty which we have in Christ Jesus, 
that they might bring us into bondage. Oh, man. Anybody think that could happen in places? Okay, well, I won't go there. I could open up a big can of worms, yeah. Um, to whom we gave place by subjection, no, not for an hour, that the truth of the gospel might continue with you, but, but of these who seemed to be somewhat whatsoever they were, it makes no matter to me, God accept no, accepts no man's persons, for they who seem to be somewhat in conference added nothing to me, but contrariwise, when they saw that the gospel of the uncircumcision was committed to me, in other words, he was, he was called to preach to the uncircumcised, to the, the ones that were outside of the Jewish, uh, you know, uh, yeah, okay. <laughs> Outside of the Jews, there were Gentiles. He was called to them. Uh, unto me, as a gospel of circumcision, was, was uh, unto Peter. For he that wrought effectively in Peter to the apostleship of the circumcision, the same was mighty in me toward the Gentiles. I'm almost done here. And when James and Cephas and John, who seemed to be pillars, Perceived the grace that was given unto me, they gave me Barnabas the right hands of fellowship that we should go unto the heathen, and and they went unto the circumcision only that we would we would remember the poor, and so that's a good thing. We need to remember the poor, right? And um, which he said I was forward to do, and, but that's just amazing there. But something happened. Um, while Peter was there eating, he was eating with the, with the Gentiles. He was hanging out with the Gentiles. Uh, but when his brethren came that were circumcised, you know, they were the more of the, the more traditional Jewish, he separated from them. And he saw that. And that was bringing a division in, in the body of Christ. And you know what? Things can get real ugly there. You guys see what I'm talking about? That that's just not right. And he faced them, and he stood up for it. Right. And so we need to be careful. I mean, that is another form of of what we're talking about here. But what the Lord is is really putting my heart on to focus to bring out here is if we come to church and we're just really primarily concerned about us, and I'm not saying that we don't have needs. But, but we lose sight of, of, of the world and we try to just live. We might go to church during the week even. We might meet in houses with believers, people that we like. But we're not really concerned or praying for, looking for those people that the Lord wants to touch. You know what? We're kind of, we're kind of falling into some of this. How many think that could be happening? You know, and that's, I bring this out because that's not who we are. You know, who are you? You guys are sons of God, right? Amen. We are sons of God. In other words, we should go out in the world and say, hey, you run into these people. You know what? God has made you a son. He wants you to be a son. He's paid the price for you to come in, you know? You don't belong in the world. You need to come in the kingdom. You need to hear what God has done in your life. There's power in the testimony. You know what? Well, you need to come out of that and you need... I'm telling you, people will listen to that kind of a, of a message, don't you think? Yeah. If we start, yeah, if we start looking to the place where there's a need, oh man, people will be more, they're more, more open to hear when they really have a need. I remember, um, I'm going to start closing here. I was, um, I was raised to build houses and I bring this out every once in a while, and I mean, I grew up, I got building in my blood and, and designing things and expanding things, just what I do. And I had a big falling out, you know, in my 30s. How many would like to just work your whole life and spend everything, put everything in this one thing, and then lose it all? That's what happened. I had a big falling out, and it was over my faith. I'll tell you just the truth, right straight up. And I had a big falling out, and it was a low point in my life. I mean, I was broken. I mean, I had no resources. We just moved. The, the kids were in, we were in Turlock and big rent and all this stuff. 
and nobody to turn to. I mean, it was not a good time not to have a job back in the 90s. It was kind of a depression, depressed state, economy. And I remember thinking, man, Lord, what do you want me to do? And what he said to me kind of shocked me. He said, I want you. I mean, I was broken. I had nothing. I was below the barrel, you know. And he says, I want you to build churches. And I thought, how in the world am I going to build churches? You know, and, and I started to learn something through that, you know, through the leading of the Spirit. I've learned that He builds through brokenness. He builds through your need. Where there is no need, you're not going to see God move very much. How many, how many realize what I'm saying? And so many people lose sight of what God is doing in this, in this generation. He is building, he's, re, he's raising up the, the tabernacle of David. Yes, he gave me the vision of the tabernacle of David. In other words, you know, there's supposed to be no walls. Everybody's supposed to be able to behold the glory of the Lord in your life. Amen. And you are all part of this tabernacle of David. We even put it on our little slogan on our website. We're a church without walls. And we're to go out and to be in the world and shine that light and to be salt, right? And not charge. I mean, it's supposed to be free. Buy the truth, but, but don't sell it. That's what it says in the scripture. And be a tabernacle. And so that's what he's raising up. And But you know what? The, 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 I'm, I'm learning this. The ones that he uses in the building process are, are, are some of the ones that people have overlooked. In other words, we get in our groups and we think he's going to use us to build the church, but you know what? He works through brokenness. He works, he, he reaches out to the needy, the ones that are on the street in the gutter or are or, or drug, uh, drugged out or are or, or, or hooked on alcohol, the ones that, oh man, he's going to use them as part of the building process, probably the main parts to raise up this body. And that's the love of God. Mm -hmm. I'm telling you. I